Good morning and good afternoon. My name is Helena Hahn and I'm a policy analyst within the European Policy Center Migration and Diversity Program. And I'm delighted to be moderating today's online policy dialogue exploring transatlantic opportunities for expanding and future-proofing refugee protection. I would like to use this opportunity to thank our partners, the US Mission to the European Union for their excellent cooperation in organizing this event. Before introducing the event, I'd like to briefly acknowledge a small change in panelists. Unfortunately, Director General Monique Paria was unable to join us today. However, we have the pleasure of having Deputy Director General Beatek Minda with us today to enrich the discussion. Now, just last week, the latest report on global trends on forced displacement was released, delivering a sobering analysis of the state of refugee protection, but also providing some indications of positive changes. The number of asylum applications made last year reflects a marked overall increase in global protection needs. And while some of this can be linked to the post-pandemic lifting of restrictions, which enable people to move more freely, it is also a reflection of the volatile and fragile situations people around the world find themselves in. Ukraine, Afghanistan, Venezuela, and Syria are but a few examples of the countries people are forced to flee. At the same time, the opportunities for providing durable solutions also seem to be shrinking. This is particularly the case as safe return remains beyond reach for the majority of forcibly displaced persons. And while resettlement numbers doubled between 2021 and 2022, they represent just 7% of the overall resettlement needs according to UNHCR. There's therefore a need for sustained commitment and action on resettlement. But a broader look at developments in EU member states and the United States also reveals a growing interest and investment in complementary pathways. Within this bargaining policy area, various schemes have been piloted, including community sponsorship and educational pathways. And with growing experience on both sides of the Atlantic, now is an opportune time to reflect on these experiences, as well as the challenges of establishing complementary pathways be it with the aim of boosting admissions, providing dedicated reception and integration support, or mobilizing them as part of crisis responses. Against this background, today's discussion is an opportunity to reflect on the way forward for ensuring and expanding access to safe protect pathways to protection. What are some of the bright spots, but also challenges to boosting refugee resettlement? What are some of the lessons learned from the displacement crisis in Afghanistan and Ukraine, and how can innovative practices stemming from them inform future responses? And given that protracted displacement situations, but also humanitarian crises will likely only increase protection needs, how could further mutual learning and coordination lead to stronger solidarity and more strategic responses on both sides of the Atlantic? To discuss these and other questions, we have with us today a distinguished panel of speakers, which I'm delighted to introduce. We have Julieta Vares Nois, who is Assistant Secretary at the State Department's Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration. Pleasure to have you with us today, Ambassador. We also have with us today Beatek Minna, who is Deputy Director General of DG Home in the European Commission, as well as Hans von der Weert, who is Senior Vice President in Resettlement, Asylum and Integration at the International Rescue Committee. Thank you all for joining me today. Before I hand over a few brief words on housekeeping, I will invite the panelists first to give their initial statements of approximately seven minutes, after which we will have a short panel discussion. The rest of the event will be dedicated to an open Q&A. If you would like to ask a question, please submit them in writing by using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. You will also have the chance to ask questions live. To do so, please use the raise the hand function. I would like to ask all participants to keep your questions as concise as possible and to please state your name and affiliation so we know who you are. And a very final note is that this event is being recorded and a recording will be available online shortly thereafter. Now, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our first speaker. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thanks, Helena, and, uh, and thanks to your team at the European Policy Center for the opportunity to join this important discussion today alongside such distinguished fellow panelists. Let me also thank all of our European partners for their efforts to provide durable protections for refugees. Shaping a rights-respecting future for displaced people takes collaboration across the international community, and we deeply value these partnerships. Thanks also to the European Commission and DG Home for their continuing leadership to expand safe legal pathways for vulnerable people. 
From the earliest days of his administration, President Biden has prioritized expanding refugee resettlement in the United States. His very first executive order on refugee policy established a very ambitious goal of 125,000 annual resettlements in the United States, a number that we had not reached in decades in this country. We have spent every day since then working towards getting to that goal. Um, we've been strengthening, expanding, and modernizing the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program to make, to make progress. We knew that first we had to rebuild our program against a backdrop of significantly weakened overseas and domestic resettlement infrastructures and the lingering effects of a global pandemic. We also faced intervening crises as we were trying to build up to those numbers that very significantly diverted our attention and resources from that work, from the fall of Kabul in August of 2021 to Putin's further invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022 to the outbreak of armed conflict in Sudan just last month. So even despite these additional challenges, I am proud to say that we are seeing the fruits of our labor. Last fiscal year, we resettled 25,000 refugees, more than double the total from the previous year. And since the start of this fiscal year, we have resettled over 34,000 refugees with still many months to go in the fiscal year. That is already our highest total of resettlement since 2016. And just since March, we have been resettling over 6,000 refugees per month. That's an increased pace that we believe we can sustain as we continue to rebuild our resettlement infrastructure to meet the president's target. So our success in doing this is a result of a strategic rebuilding process that's focused around three priorities. First, incorporating lessons that we learned from emergency responses in Afghanistan and Ukraine. Second, positioning our program on a more durable foundation for the future and third, modernizing the program to respond to evolving needs and emerging opportunities. So let me talk first about the lessons from Afghanistan and Ukraine. To date, the United States has welcomed more than 97,000 Afghans fleeing the Taliban's rise of power and over 136,000 individuals forced to flee Putin's continuing aggression in Ukraine. We've done it by finding and creating new lawful pathways and uh, from, from within our system. Experts inside and outside the US government have talked for years about pursuing innovative ways to expand and streamline our, our screening, immigration and assistance processes. We needed to make them more agile and responsive in emergency situations. And these crises forced us to stop talking about it and actually start doing it. So we found that even providing for even the most basic needs has required significant innovations. As millions of Afghans began to flee Kabul in August of 21, communities across the United States were facing an affordable housing crisis, uh, one that I know that you also face in Europe. Um, it, it was already complicating our traditional refugee resettlement efforts. So faced with the reality that our assistance funds were inadequate to buy our way out of this situation, we found new ways to partner with the private sector to mobilize additional resources and public engagement. We capitalized on the huge public outpouring of support from American citizens and companies in collaboration with an organization called Welcome.us, a nonprofit that was created to coordinate government private and nonprofit sector assistance to those arriving from Afghanistan. Companies like Airbnb are now working directly with US resettlement agencies to meet refugees' immediate housing needs. These and other public-private partnerships make our responses faster and more agile, words we never would have used in the past to describe our traditional refugee resettlement processes. Second, let me talk about durability. This is my favorite example, because at the same time that he gave us an ambitious overall resettlement target, President Biden also directed us to develop a pilot program for private refugee sponsorship. And so while we were working on everything else that I just described, we were working on that too. And in January of 2023, just a few months ago, we launched the Welcome Corps, a new initiative that enables private citizens, everyday Americans, to participate directly in refugee resettlement. 
The Welcome Corps is the boldest innovation in U.S. refugee resettlement in over 40 years, basically since the program was created. Um, and we learned a lot as we were creating this model from programs in many other countries, including many in Europe. So thank you for that. Since we launched Welcome Corps, thousands of Americans have expressed interest in becoming private sponsors. And I am thrilled to share that on World Refugee Day on Tuesday, the very first group of privately sponsored refugees arrived in the United States to a very warm welcome in the state of Minnesota from their private sponsors. So of course, we believe that Welcome Corps' private sponsorship model will help us to resettle larger numbers of refugees. But we also believe that the private sponsorship model can broaden and deepen support for resettlement among the American public. So it's a win-win. We hope Welcome Corps will become as iconic an American brand as the Peace Corps. And we think that that is the key to true durability. So as we work to put this program of refugee resettlement on a sustainable footing, we are also addressing the third priority that I mentioned, which is adapting to evolving needs and demands. Now, of the over 100 million people, Helena, that you mentioned, uh, UNHCR estimates are displaced worldwide. Over 20 million of them are right here in the Western Hemisphere. Many of them undertake a truly perilous journey north to the U.S. border, uh, the southern border, and that's created a hemispheric migration crisis of unprecedented scale and a corresponding humanitarian crisis for both the vulnerable migrants on the route and many of the communities that host them. This month, in response, we announced agreements with the governments of Guatemala and Costa Rica to launch pilot phases of an initiative that we're calling Safe Mobility. Safe Mobility offices represent a new effort to facilitate migrants' access to refugee resettlement pre-screening and obtain information about existing lawful pathways to the United States and other countries like Canada or Spain. Most importantly, these safe mobility offices meet migrants where they are, closer to their homes, and hopefully before they put themselves in the hands of exploitative criminal organizations. I'd like to close with one last example of an initiative that goes right to the heart of transatlantic and truly global resettlement partnerships. We recently launched the Resettlement Diplomacy Network, which we're calling RDN because we love acronyms in America. It is a new dynamic platform aimed at facilitating high level engagement and collaboration among governments and on shared resettlement policy priorities. We believe that the RDN offers a unique platform for refugee resettlement, uh, for countries that engage in refugee resettlement to come together to identify areas where our collaborative action can catalyze progress to expand resettlement and offer other protection pathways. Earlier this month, we convened the first senior officials meeting here in Washington with government officials from Australia, Canada, Italy, New Zealand, Spain, and the United Kingdom, along with representatives of the European Commission. Our discussions surfaced several opportunities for collective action to strengthen global resettlement infrastructure, to better prepare for emergency situations, and to more effectively share responsibility for resettling refugees. The RDN represents the very best of what we can do together across the Atlantic and across the world. So I want to thank you again for having me today, and I look forward to your questions. Also, my phone is ringing, and my husband was going to call me about something at home, so I'm going to turn my camera off for one second and come right back after I talk to my husband. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Ambassador, and thank you as well for highlighting some of the um, impressive um, progress that you've made in, in just the past couple of months, as well as exciting new developments um, that I'm sure we'll discuss further in, in this event. Um, I would like to now hand over to Deputy Director General um, for your insights. Please, the floor is yours. And I have to unmute. Welcome, and thank you very much that I have the opportunity to be with you today. Julieta has already said many of very interesting insights. Um, we in Europe had also a key moment. Uh, that is two weeks ago in Luxembourg, where EU and member states reached an agreement on the Migration Asylum Pact, 
which is now paving the way towards better and fairer rules in the EU. We're still having a path of negotiation with the parliament ahead, but I think we are very optimistic that we will come to a conclusion of these negotiations and to a balanced and fair a package that would set the, the, all the rules in Europe again to a new, um, to a new start. Um, I'm not sure I would still call them or uh, call these rules ACHA, like Julieta has said, but I think they're a very promising start. We have also seen uh, irregular migration to the EU strongly increasing in recent months. We had uh, very tragic shipwrecks off the Greek coast and the one a few months back off the coast of Alab Calabria and Italy. These are reminders that we need more safe and legal pathways to reach the EU for those looking for work and for those in need of international protection. We need to show solidarity. Promoting safe and legal pathways is an inherent element of the new pact, and we are work very, very closely working with our member states in this area, and you know well they have the competence for resettlement. It's high on our and their agenda. We have gathered experience through uh, EU support resettlement schemes since 2015. We have more than 115,000 vulnerable refugees that found a new home in the member states. And in addition to that, we had last year particularly around 45,000 Afghans at risk that were admitted to the EU. We must, however, see this in the overall context. The EU is currently hosting around 4 million refugees who were fleeing the war in Ukraine. And the member states received only last year more than 880,000 asylum applications in, uh, in the EU. And the trend this year is no different. Member states are Comem and despite upholding their commitment to resettlement against this challenging context, and I find this very commendable. There's also a new momentum due to the recent agreement in December last year on the Union Resettlement and Humanitarian Admission Framework Regulation, and hopefully it will be adopted soon. It will provide a common framework for EU efforts, help speak with one voice, and hopefully incentivize the member states to provide more places for resettlement and humanitarian admission as you know, it's a voluntary effort, but a very important one. We as Commission, we want to facilitate and support these efforts. We just invited Member States to make new pledges for the time of, uh, 24 and 25. And we organized a high level discussion with Commissioner Johansson and some Member States to provide political support for the exercise. As Julieta has said, global resettlement needs are extremely high and they keep rising year on year. So we can address these needs best by building strong partnerships with our partner countries, such as the US, Canada, and the UK. And the high level resettlement forums that we organized in 21, 22 to foster cooperation among key resettlement countries show that joint global leadership that is really required. And the new forum that has been recently created uh, as reference to Julieta, the Resettlement Diplomacy Network is a very interesting initiative and we are ready to engage in this forum. Uh, it's our joint objective to respond collectively to global resettlement needs and make sure that the system works well and efficiently. Agile was the word mentioned, and I think this is a good uh, paraphrase. Looking ahead, we need to find ways to ensure sustained commitment to resettlement and other pathways to protection. And we need to consider what it takes for future proofing of resettlement. So innovative practices are very important. Some were already mentioned. And in the EU, we first look at other legal pathways in addition to resettlement. Uh, it is resettlement, as you know very well, is reserved for the most vulnerable for, and skills based legal pathways have a role to play. A lot has happened recently on refugee labor pathways. We discussed at the high level forum last November, and we have just made new funding available for projects in this area that will run over the next three years. We're also working with member states to promote refugee student mobility, which is also a very promising avenue for young people in need of protection to realize their aspirations. All this very well understood refugee student mobility, but also refugee labor pathways is additional to the traditional resettlement, but it's an interesting uh, new path. Second, we need to work more closely with civil society. We have seen the overwhelming response in the context of the displacement linked to the war in Ukraine, where so many people open their homes to those in need. And similar to the US, US, we need to keep this momentum and encourage citizens to keep up these efforts beyond the Ukraine response. We are already promoting community sponsorship schemes in the EU, and we hope to see much more of these models in the member states. 
to create a warm welcome for newcomers and, and to promote welcoming host societies. So we have tasked our own EU asylum agency to look into the EU approach to community sponsorship as we see a variety of models with different degrees of civil society engagement. They range from humanitarian corridors, where civil society is involved in all stages of the procedure, to somewhat lighter models where civil society provides practical support on everyday matters. Our asylum agency will prepare a guiding document and we look forward to its release later this year. Finally, we have seen that housing is one of the main bottlenecks to scaling up resettlement and other pathways to protection. And this, I think, as said earlier, is worldwide. Linked to what I said earlier, we need to find ways to tackle this reception crisis that we are facing in many member states. So to make sure that resettlement will not lose out. Again, civil society and individuals can make an important contribution here. There's much we can learn from the recent experience and the response to the war in Ukraine. And we are working on a safe home guidance so that the member states know how to identify safe hosts and that we also give incentives to those that are hosting people in need of protection uh, in their private homes. We work with the Red Cross who implements this project for us and we're looking forward to the guidance emerging. On all these elements, we see a lot of added value in working with our international partners. For instance, UK and Canada have much more experience on refugee labor pathways. We want to learn from that. The US faces similar challenges on resettlement as we do. We must join forces and cooperate in a spirit of strategic solidarity. We will, as EU, uphold our engagement in the various existing forums in this policy field, including with UNHCR and IOM, and we are open to joining new initiatives such as the Resettlement Diplomacy Network to achieve the overarching joint goal that we have, providing more and legal pathways to protection to the refugees of this world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Director General, um, for likewise outlining um, some of the um, progress and achievements over the past couple of uh, years, in fact, um, and also highlighting some uh, points when it comes to sponsorship as well as the reception crisis, which um, I expect we will maybe return to in the, uh, in the subsequent discussion. Um, I'd like to now hand over to our final panelist, um, Mr. Van der Ver, thank you again for joining us. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Helena, um, and um, uh, thank you to EPC for uh, inviting me to speak today. Um, uh, I'm feeling very honored to be here. Um, uh, thank you also, uh, Ambassador and the Deputy Director General, for your very rich uh, contributions just now. Um, my perspective to this discussion will be that um, of a practitioner. Uh, I'm leading the Global Resettlement Asylum and Integration Work for the International Rescue Committee. Um, as a European in America, um, uh, I've been working on refugee and asylum issues for the past 10 years. Um, and our work in the US extends to 30 cities. Uh, we work along the US southern border. Um, we also work in Central America. Um, and for the past eight years, we've been active in Europe as well. And currently my organization implements uh, programs, uh, resettlement asylum and integration programs in about 15 European countries along the arc of crisis from uh, Greece to Germany. Um, and inside my organization, you know, our work in Boise, Idaho informs our activities in Berlin um, and the experiences that we face um, in Greece are not dissimilar from what we see at the sort of southern border. Um, and I'm sharing uh, this because I, I want to convey that my organization is deeply invested in transatlantic dialogue um, on refugee and asylum issues. Um, but also because from those exchanges, I know there is a, a real potential and a real value uh, in these type of exchanges and in learning uh, from each other. Um, I'm going to touch on a couple of things uh, today uh, that the ambassador and uh, um, deputy director general have mentioned as well. Um, but I very much come to some of these issues from our uh, client's perspective. Um, and I think starting, you know, it's not easy to talk about um, refugee and asylum policy in today's very politicized environment, uh, which makes, I think, the policy making and coming up with uh, effective solutions uh, even harder. Um, but our challenges in talking about it and coming up with, uh, with policy solutions 
I mean, pale in comparison with what refugees and asylum seekers uh, go through. The deputy uh, director general mentioned um, the boat uh, tragedy that happened uh, in Greece uh, just a week ago, uh, but it's more than a tragedy. It's in fact, um, I think a failure of policy when these things uh, happen. And, and before I, I speak about uh, the bright spots and promising policy directions and where I will echo some of the things um, that have been said before, I, I do feel it's necessary to call out some of these policy failures uh, that refugees and asylum seekers you know, bear the brunt of every day um, and where we have to do better uh, collectively um, uh, to come up with solutions. Um, We've mentioned the, the escalating global resettlement needs, um, and it's true that commitments uh, for resettlement spots have been increasing, but commitments are not you know, actual resettlement, and we have to be very um, aware uh, that a lot of the resettlement commitments are still very fragile uh, uh, these days. Um, and I think more is expected from high-income nations. Um, to, 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 to take that responsibility. And I think still today, too often the responsibility is left to middle income nations, uh, Pakistan, Uganda, Colombia, Jordan, um, while we still see a hardening um, at, our, at our own borders. Um, for example, in Europe, uh, I think the continued lack of safe and legal routes uh, to exercise the right to asylum, um, I consider that still a failure of policy and the the absence of adequate systems to access protection and durable solutions from third countries, um, the really meager processing capacities at hotspots, um, the absence of effective return mechanisms for, for those asylum claims that fail, they create chaos. Um, and ultimately, uh, that only benefits uh, uh, the, the, the smugglers. And in America, um, that's not much better, I think, um, uh, the decision of the U.S. government to keep uh, the border era, uh, the COVID era restrictions in place at the border, uh, may have been uh, a necessary political choice, but it made it impossible for people to access protection, especially the most vulnerable. Um, and so we see that that also forces still more people uh, to engage smugglers um, or to be exposed to dangers in uh, in Mexico. Um, and the temporary pathways that we spoke about uh, earlier um, that were offered to Afghans and Ukrainians uh, that were a very effective uh, a quick fix, fix um, should not be confused for uh, durable solutions. Um, uh, and they should also not be uh, just uh, used to justify, I think, policy that erode the right to asylum uh, or uh, should not uh, unwillingly create inequities for other people in need of uh, protections. Um, they are incomplete policies, in fact, if there's no permanent pathway to um, citizenship or, or integration. And they, these programs remain deeply vulnerable uh, to political uh, ups and downs around these uh, uh, programs. So need to really be embedded more firmly in a regulatory uh, a framework. Um, so I think there's still a lot of space to do better. Um, and listening to uh, the ambassador and uh, to the deputy director, director general, I'm really hopeful um, about, uh, about the commitment uh, of both the EU and the US in this space um, and about some of the more recent uh, developments as well. Um, you know, I wanted to start also by applauding the creation of the Resettlement Diplomacy Network. Um, I think it is really important that we reverse uh, the race to uh, the bottom and that we increase uh, resettlement numbers across high income nations uh, and that uh, EU and the US will further explore how they can share processing and referral structures uh, across countries, exchanging lessons learned uh, from these two crises that, uh, that, 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 that both of the representatives talking about. Um, we're equally very hopeful about the creation of complementary pathways uh, private sponsorship, labor mobility, uh, education-based schemes. Uh, my organization is deeply involved with these uh, programs. Um, I was very glad to hear uh, that they are considered an addition to the resettlement uh, uh, pathways, do not replace them. Uh, but we also have to make sure that these pathways um, are really flexible, pragmatic, 
and that they offer fast ways uh, to protection to, uh, to, to people. Um, a couple of things uh, that I think we haven't spoken about uh, yet. Um, we think that in um, good policies, uh, the provision of humane reception um, of newcomers, uh, humane reception facilities with fair and orderly processes, with perhaps case management as an alternative for uh, detention uh, measures uh, could be really uh, a beneficial uh, approach and could actually lead to more order rather than the chaos uh, that we see. We've seen the benefits of this approach uh, in several US uh, states um, and pilots around community-based uh, alternatives uh, to detention actually result in 99% of uh, compliance with immigration uh, procedures. And I think it's important to call this out um, because in particular, you know, if we look at the current direction of the agreements of the new uh, EU pact on migration, uh, we see that detention is still at the core of some of these uh, directions. And so we really encourage, you know, more um, exposure to the learnings of some of the things that we've seen in the United, uh, in the United States. Um, we're very glad about uh, talking still about the migration pact, uh, that there is also a space for independent border monitoring. Uh, we believe that that's a really critical uh, a policy element. Um, uh, and we really hope uh, that these monitoring mechanisms will remain truly independent and that recommendations will be, uh, will be, will be followed. Um, a lot of the vulnerability of refugees and asylum seekers also follows from the fact that there's a lot of misinformation about uh, what actually is available uh, uh, to them. Uh, and many people um, uh, take action based on, uh, you know, a, a lack of awareness on the pathways that there, uh, that there are. And so we think that there should also be a lot of policy attention uh, towards how we can inform refugees and asylum seekers uh, giving them clear and transparent information about how, how they can access protection instead of uh, discouraging uh, uh, that so that they will become less of a target to uh, vulnerable uh, groups. And I think with today's technology, uh, there is a lot of space to do, uh, to do just that. Um, lastly, and I think both uh, um, the ambassador and the uh, deputy director general spoke about it, um, the public support for refugee resettlement, in fact, is much larger than I think we sometimes assume uh, if we listen to the vocal conservative minorities uh, only. Um, I looked at some recent polling in the United States. 77% of the people, in fact, support uh, refugee resettlement. And so private sponsorship, uh, in particular, offers great potential not only for um, uh, service delivery, but also to really create uh, the political support um, for very ambitious uh, protection uh, agenda. So again, as, as a European living in, in America, I am very much an optimist. I, I believe in the value of our uh, societies. I think uh, the work that both the EU and the US government have done around the US, uh, the, the Afghan evacuation and the Ukraine response have demonstrated that uh, that with political will, public support, uh, and a willingness to reform, uh, protection can be offered on a much, much greater scale. Um, and I think during these uncertain times, we need many more pathways, uh, not less. And I think uh, Europe and, uh, and the US can really lead the way, uh, in particular, if they, if they work uh, together on these issues. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Van der Weert, um, for um, highlighting what I believe will provide a lot of food for thought. Um, I'd like to give um, the other speakers the chance, of course, to react now. Um, but in addition to this, um, add a question of my own. Um, we have now covered quite a variety of, of pathways and, and of different systems and, and programs that have, put in, have been put into place. Um, 
We've also acknowledged that there are challenges both in making resettlement systems more resilient, but also more flexible. And so when we look ahead, I'm wondering if you can share your thoughts on how you see the balance between resettlement, humanitarian admissions as defined in the, in the European context and more temporary statuses going forward. Um, at the high level forum last fall, a member of the European parliament, for instance, spoke of a toolbox of durable solutions for displaced persons. So happy to hear your thoughts as well as any reactions that you might have. And if I could maybe start with you, Ambassador. Great, thanks, um, Helena and, and Hans and Beata. Um, really rich conversation so far. I do want to respond um, to, to a couple of things that the, that the other panelists mentioned. Um, so Hans, uh, a lot to respond to in what you said, and, and thank you so much for the, for the support for the initiatives that we have underway. I, I do want to clarify that the Biden administration opposed the continuation of the, uh, of the COVID restrictions at the border and fought them in court until they were finally lifted. And those are no longer in place. We now have uh, more, a much more normal process at, at the border um, and, in terms of the permanent status for Afghans, the administration is also very strongly supportive of legislation, bipartisan legislation that's been introduced in the Congress to provide um, permanent status for those Afghan allies who, who we have brought to the United States and the administration continues to work um, in as, as strongly as possible with members of Congress to get that, to get that uh, passed. Um, could not agree with you more about the importance of messaging in order to get to migrants and, and prospective migrants, um, both so that they have the information that they need, but also so that they are not exploited by criminal organizations. And I think that the whole question of messaging and of information sharing is a really critical one in everything that we're trying to do in the United States, everything that um, our partners in Europe are trying to do, and this is a, an area for, for much more collaboration, I believe. Um, thank you both for mentioning the Resettlement Diplomacy Network. We're, we are very excited about it. We think there's a, a great deal of potential for work there. Um, Helena, to get to your question about the balance between permanent solutions, durable solutions, um, like refugee resettlement, but temporary pathways like the, for example, the Uniting for Ukraine uh, two-year parole pathway that we have in the United States. Uh, I think the, the answer is that in a world of rapidly growing forcibly displaced populations, we have to have as many tools as possible. And that involves, of course, refugee resettlement, which is truly a durable pathway, um, but it has to be not just a handful of nations around the world. You know, we need to expand the number of countries that are providing these durable uh, solutions. Uh, those of us who are doing it need to do more and we need to persuade other countries to do it as well. We also need to have um, temporary pathways like parole pathways, um, some of the work that we're all doing in terms of more innovative approaches to resettlement, like, like labor or, or education pathways. But I would add that another thing that we, um, that we need to collaborate on and focus on is also capacity building in other nations. And that is something that we focus on a great deal um, in the bureau that I lead and across the United States government is is not just what can we, the United States do within the United States, but how can we help countries that are confronting these challenges themselves? And so in that context, um, the United States is very proud to have uh, endorsed together with 20 other countries in the Western hemisphere, the LA Declaration on Migration and Protection, which establishes a, a common understanding among countries of the Western hemisphere that this is a challenge that no one country can meet alone. It is a challenge that we all face together and we all have to work on together. And it's, it's got fundamental pillars of stabilizing communities and, and people in need, creating new lawful pathways, humane migration management, and then emergency response. But within that context, 
We um, provide a great deal of assistance um, to our partners working through, for example, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, the International Organization for Migration, to help countries in our hemisphere create their own protection um, systems. And so we are very proud, for example, to have been a major contributor uh, to the government of Colombia and to the government of Colombia's efforts to provide temporary protective status to Venezuelans for 10 years. And uh, Colombia now is hosting something like 2.4 million Venezuelans and giving them a legal status, a right to work, very similar to what the EU is doing for Ukrainians. Um, so, so there's a lot that we need to do within our own borders, but also to help countries that are confronting these situations um, within their own borders. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, before I hand over, um, I just want to issue a quick reminder to all participants that you are more than welcome to already start posting your questions or alternatively raise your hand. We'll be starting the Q&A um, in a short while. So please feel free um, to already provide any questions that you might have. Um, but before that, please over to you, Deputy Director General. Well, I think uh, you can see very much from what the, the ambassador just said, how much migration is a global challenge, because everything you said, Julieta, I could repeat also for the European side. And it's good that we're also trying to find uh, joint solutions because uh, we want to be fair with people. Uh, but at the same time, we also need not to overburden our own societies. And that's why I think it's so important to think also about legal and resettlement pathways from the back end, you know, how can you integrate people best? And that's why we're also now so much putting emphasis on community sponsorship, because then you're already arrived with a host. You have someone who holds your hand during the first time you're here because you will need help, particularly in Europe, where the language issue is even a lot more significant than in the States. Huh? Uh, so that is something we, we, we would like to, but that's also where I think we need to discuss then what we do upfront at the border, because the situation at our borders is not tenable. And we need to provide a better system that we can be fair with people, uh, give those that are in need of protection access, but also avoid that everyone who comes for economic uh, prospects goes an irregular pathway instead of a legal pathway. We have big challenges in Europe with legal pathway because of um, visa um, applications. We're very slow in giving visas, particularly for work. And one of the reasons is capacity that Julieta was also mentioning. Uh, working in migration is a hugely capacity building exercise with a human factor. The people that arrive are humans and we are, who are welcoming them are working with them are humans. So, you know, you need to have a lot of people and in the time of very strengthened and strained public uh, budgets, not strengthened, strained public budgets, it's very much a, a difficulty. I could also mirror on the messaging towards uh, migrants. You know, I was very heart stricken last week when the terrible uh, accident happened in Greece that many uh, people have had people had relatives in Europe who knew that this would be a very difficult journey, very dangerous. You know, there's so many horrible uh, uh, stories and, 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 and dangers that are possibly even be out there, but they're not really communicated. And then, and the hope always uh, makes it beyond the fear that something happens to you. Huh? And last but not least, what Hans was saying also on the, on the um, migration pact, we try to strike a balance. It's a difficult one. Huh? We have very complicated discussions between member states. It's going on for years. We want to find a new system. It will never be perfect. Uh, it will have, uh, everyone will have to find something for uh, uh, in it, but it will have to be a system that it's agreed by everyone to, uh, again, put a reset button, how we deal uh, with migration uh, policies and asylum policies. And we really want to push that and we're hopeful it will happen. Thank you so much. Um, please, Mr. Van der Verde, over to you for any uh, reactions or responses you might have. Yeah, I would maybe just like to um, uh, refocus, um, you know, our attention on the lessons learned uh, during these two big crises, uh, where um, I think I, I believe the ambassador said it right, where instead of talking, uh, we did, and we discovered uh, the capacity of our own communities uh, and of our own systems, but where we were also 
able to um, reduce some of the um, internal uh, uh, bureaucracy uh, around how we have organized these things over uh, many decades. And I think uh, when we talk about, uh, you know, the capacity needed to do um, uh, this work, a lot of the capacity is also um, focused on investments in a very complicated uh, bureaucracy. And so simplification uh, around family reunification, for example, uh, could really um, um, uh, do a lot of um, uh, good for clients but could also reduce actually the pressure on, uh, on capacity. Uh, in the US, um, you know, simplifying the employment authorization uh, procedures for people that arrive uh, will put them on a much faster pathway uh, uh, to, uh, to success where people will be less dependent upon uh, uh, public support. And so when we talk about uh, the capacity needed, we often talk about, you know, the investments we need to make more, uh, more people that need to uh, be hired. But for me, uh, you know, it is also a simplification of uh, of things that have become very complicated um, uh, over over the years. Um, as for the pact and as for border management, um, I want to be very clear. Uh, you know, IRC is not advocating for open borders and for, you know, chaos and and. And, and stress at the border. Um, but we need to make sure um, that the most vulnerable have access to a protection. And I do think that we can come up with systems and with solutions that do not detain uh, our families and, uh, and children, uh, and that sort of like provide alternatives. And there, um, uh, we've learned um, in previous uh, US uh, phases that this is actually really possible. It's, it's possible uh, uh, to, uh, to do this. And so I think there we can probably um, uh, do more. Um, a last thing that I would say about um, the private support that we also recognize as an NGO um, as well, um, it's a great potential asset uh, but it's not an asset, uh, and the ambassador knows that because we've talked about it in the U.S. as well. It's not an asset that activates itself. You have to also cultivate uh, the connections. You have to, uh, um, you know, help uh, the, the direction of all of that uh, of that energy, uh, you know, towards where that is needed uh, uh, most. And I think um, one of the I think it fo focus areas for the discussion between civil society and government should also be. You know, how do we harness that uh, energy and how do we make sure that that goes to the uh, to the right uh, directions as well? Because otherwise, you know, chaos can easily uh, arise as well. And we're not using the assets that are there uh, in an optimal uh, manner. Thank you so much. Um, I would uh, like to piggyback off that very last point to ask um, a question relating to sponsorship, which is that, of course, in the US, um, the pilot scheme was only launched a couple of uh, a couple of months ago. Um, in the EU, we have seen several pilot schemes um, that take on very different um, shapes and sizes, um, launched at different times over the past couple of years. And now there's an additional link when it comes to the Safe Homes Initiative, which was of course launched last year um, following the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And so I'm wondering um, broadly if, um, how you foresee to uh, process the kind of experiences and the lessons learned from these initiatives um, in terms of any kind of monitoring and evaluation and perhaps in relation to the Safe Homes Initiative, if there are any insights in addition to the uh, brief points that you already mentioned that could provide insightful for any future community or private sponsorship schemes um, and people that are um, interested in participating. Perhaps if I could again start with you first, Ambassador. Well, I think that it, it's important that we that we look at the at the universe of options and and work with the communities involved and work with our traditional structures and really be as creative as possible and frankly learn lessons. We we learned some important lessons that were positive from our experiences with, with the Afghans and Ukrainians, but, uh, but also some lessons of things that didn't work quite as well. For example, the point that Hans made about the Afghans arrived under a parole status, and now we are sort of struggling with the political um, difficulty of giving them a more permanent status. 
So trying to get things right from the beginning is is an important lesson that that um, that we need you know we need to acknowledge when things go right, but also when we could have done a little better. Thanks so much, uh, Deputy Director General. Over to you. Yes, no, I, I think, you know, so far we have a quite positive experience. That's why we're so interested to increase it. Huh? And I think the most professional and the most known one is probably the one in Italy, where we have three faith-based organizations working very closely with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Interior Minister in implementing a very large scheme and a very helpful scheme. Because frankly, I have to tell you, sometimes when we had uh, difficult cases, politically also difficult, I remember once three refugees stranded at the Green Line in, in, on Cyprus, uh, they were resettled through a, a faith-based um, humanitarian corridor to Italy, and that was very, very helpful. Um, so ultimately, we think this is a, a good way to go. And uh, of course, sometimes um, we could do more, and uh, NGOs would like to do more. And then we're faced with other constraints that we're not managing uh, to find so quickly the possibilities to move. And that's something we, we will try to work on more. Um, I also think one thing about resettlement, we always look at the arrival process. We hardly ever look at the departure process. And the departure process is also extremely very slow. Huh? Um, and I have heard stories of nearly 14 months uh, that it takes for member states to settle all the capacity, all the, the visa, all the arrangements for, for arriving, finding the right place. And people during that time wait in a transit center. That's a very long time, particularly when it involves vulnerable children, women. So I think that's something where I would also, perhaps with a diplomacy network, put a bit more effort on, on, on uh, accelerating. Thank you so much. Um, any reactions from your end? Um, over to you. To, to the last point uh, uh, that Beata made, um, I couldn't agree more. I think there is a lot we can do um, on the front end uh, of things. And I think, you know, part of the success of the US administration in, uh, in getting the numbers up was actually because they invested so much uh, on the front end uh, of, of things and really accelerated uh, the processes. And I think more um, initiatives in that area um, are, are, I think, necessary, but also very welcome. I think there is also a, um, a, a client-facing side of that uh, too. Um, IRC runs um, uh, CORE, which is a, a cultural orientation uh, platform, where we prepare people also pre-departure for uh, their arrivals, where we prepare civil society also for what's happening. I believe there is a, a big untapped potential also there to um, talking get also about the messaging to uh, to people that will be arriving uh, to do more on the front end uh, of, uh, of, of of things. So I, I think that's a very important point. Um, more in general, um, I think when you do reform, when you do innovations. Um, there is clearly a risk of failure. And uh, I think we should embrace uh, that rather than run away from it uh, uh, as long as we learn. Like, I, I, I think, you know, we also have found that there are things to be um, improved upon. Uh, we have found within civil society a lot of resistance against some of the reform uh, as well because people are afraid to, um, uh, to lose tried and tested methods. But I think if you want to scale up and if you really want to do things differently and if you want to be ready um, for, 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 for much larger numbers, uh, you got to be willing also to, um, yeah, to make mistakes as well and then to learn uh, from, uh, from them. Um, and, uh, and I think that is applicable as much to the government as that it is to uh, civil society um, uh, as well in this in this aspect. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to now open the floor um, to all audience members um, to ask any questions. I see we already have two in the chat. Um, as mentioned, uh, please feel free to either provide written questions um, and you are also able to ask questions live if you would prefer to do so. 
Um, so the first question is for um, Deputy Director General uh, Gminda, which is considering the many challenges that lie ahead, but also some promising developments, how will the EU resettlement framework help future proofing resettlement resettlement needs, if you can maybe go more um, into depth uh, what the changes uh, would be between the um, framework that we currently have and what would happen following adoption. And the second question is, um, uh, is about the availability of legal pathways um, that could allow people to, or that would reduce the incentives for irregular migration um, which is um, that uh, why do even vulnerable people um, that would qualify for, for resettlement uh, believe that legal pathways are very long and uh, in, entail complicated processes and therefore um, opt for uh, dangerous, um, dangerous journeys to reach um, their desired uh, country of asylum. If you could perhaps um, expand a little bit more uh, on that question, maybe linking it also to misinformation that we discussed earlier. Um, if I could maybe then again start with you, Ambassador, um, and uh, then turn over to the other panelists um, for the question relating to uh, the Union Resettlement Framework as well. The floor is Great. yours. Thanks, Helena. And, um, and I want to thank Mohammed for that question in the chat box. I, and I think there's several reasons why uh, migrants undertake dangerous journeys to try and reach safety. The first is because the world is becoming a more difficult and complicated place and more people are frankly in danger as a result of conflict, as a result of um, violence, as a result of corrupt governments that don't provide services, as a result of changes caused by climate change. Unfortunately, there are more people who are feeling the need to move in order to find uh, new solutions for their family. The second reason is that criminal organizations are more than prepared to step in and to create false narratives and provide false hopes in exchange for money uh, and uh, frequently subject these people who are, who are fleeing for their lives or trying to find new futures for their families. And uh, the truth is that governments have not done a good enough job, frankly, of combating the criminal organizations or countering the messaging. We all have to be more agile. We all have to do a better job of getting the real information out there. The third reason is, and here I'm, you know, a true, I'm, I'm admitting to reality, which is that the truth is that sometimes legal pathways have taken too long. We have had, for example, in the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program, some people who have been waiting for years for resettlement, and that's just not acceptable. So we, one of the things that we have been trying to do with our refugee um, admissions program is to, to really cut back the cases that are within the pipeline and to, to clear out cases who have been waiting for years by either resettling them or concluding the cases and letting the, letting the applicants know that this is not going to work for them so that they can choose new solutions. The other way that we're trying to, to address that issue is not just clearing out old cases, but really reducing the timeline that it takes for people to reach this durable solution of refugee resettlement. We're, we're trying to, to cut the amount of time between application and arrival in the United States or referral and arrival in the United States um, to under to under three months when we can do that. Um, we've made a lot of progress in that regard, but this is, you know, we're trying to do a lot of different things at once. And um, while, we're, while we're pleased with the progress that we've made, we understand that we need to do more. And then the, the fourth reason why I think migrants undertake these, these long journeys because they're, they're simply not convinced that they can do something faster is because we don't yet have enough complementary pathways. We're all working on that and we've had a, a great conversation here about all of the things that we're trying to do, but we all need to get more creative and find new solutions to help people who are really at risk um, to include integration in other countries, to include temporary pathways, to include humanitarian parole, to include labor or educational pathways, to include 
permanent refugee resettlement and maybe some new pathways that we haven't even thought of yet. I mean, we have to all be creative and we all have to continue to come up with, with answers and solutions. Um, so there are a lot of reasons why people undertake these dangerous journeys. Um, and there are a lot of things that we as, as governments and, and humanitarians need to do to try and persuade them not to do that and to give them other options. So thanks for that question, Mohammed. Thank you so much um, for elaborating a bit on that, Ambassador. Um, Deputy D Director General, um, be happy to hear from you a bit more about, um, about the Union Resettlement Framework. I think, first of all, it's very important that it puts what we currently practice into a framework that will be stable and that is agreed between the member states. And it was also an, is an important element of our pact where we have several elements. We have the pillar of uh, working with third countries. We have the legal pathway pillar. We have the resettlement pillar as one of those. Then, you know, we have the pillar of how do we manage uh, people that arrive irregularly. So the, it's part of a, a holistic uh, ecosystem to manage um, protection and migration. And uh, it is a procedural nature, this union resettlement framework. So a lot of the details will have to be worked out. It does say that 60% of what the numbers we will agree on should be through resettlement. Then there are some other pathways forcing and also emergency procedures. Uh, but generally it stabilizes the current uh, pledging exercise, which is every year or every second year, and which is therefore very cumbersome and never gives a predict predictability and uh, for the system. So I think that's a key element of it. Then coming to the many reasons why people are on the move, I think, Julieta, you have said already very comprehensively, uh, there is many. And unfortunately, some are linked to us being slow. Some are linked to slow family reunification. Some are linked for having to wait long. Even within the EU, I have to tell you, we have relocation exercises. And for again and again, we see that people, rather than waiting until you know they're screened and that they're security interviewed, they go on the next train and move to another member state where they wanted to go and which is their final destination. Uh, and these are people who are very often in need of protection, you know, so they are not uh, evade, uh, avoiding being, being uh, coming to the forefront. So the slowness of administrations is definitely uh, a, a big, big point in all this. And this is also linked to the question on, are we doing enough? And uh, why are we complaining that it's not fast enough? We in the EU, of course, have an additional challenge. We are not a government that uh, puts out, like in the States, the actual residence permit or the permission or the visa. It is our member states. So again, you would always have the cultural um, uh, the culture also coming in, how fast do I do that? What is my relationship with that third country? How proactive am I in resettlement and so on and so on. So there are also these political and, and, and human factors. And um, I think also we're seeing a third question in the chat on, on the refugee labor mobility pathways and uh, will we stabilize that a bit further? Certainly a big interest in it, but again, it's not the EU who will do the residence permit, and we also have very limited competences. So we give rules that we have a single permit for member for people in the EU that are not EU nationals when they move. We also have rules uh, how to uh, spell out uh, long-term residence and how to count if you have in several member states a, a stay for work, a stay for study, and that just counts together to give you a more long-term residence possibility uh, in the in the in the EU but the actual you know um, citizenship uh, pathway is for the member state to decide it has not been given as a responsible to the European Union knowing that and saying that many of our member states face really serious labor shortages and are therefore making a huge effort to attract more talents and we do help with uh, something we call the talent partnership that we are trying to get all the individual initiatives of member states into one narrative and that we offer a package to a third country for the EU. Uh, we are interested in, you, in, in uh, that you have people that want to work with us. And at the same time, we're also interested in that your country benefits from working with us in uh, developing also the country where people uh, are on the move. Thank you so much. Um, I would then also be happy to hear from the ambassador any additional thoughts that she has on, on the third um, question that we received on uh, labor mobility pathways um, and the links to protection. But before doing so, um, I would be happy to give the floor to Mr. Van der Berg for any of uh, his thoughts. Over to you. 
Well, thank you also for the question that, that Mohammed asked. Uh, I, I do feel that um, that the ambassador and the deputy director general um, really answered that uh, that question uh, uh, very very well. Um, and I was very glad to hear to hear both also say you know a lot of this is also related to the processes that are very lengthy and complicated and and their commitment to. Uh, to address it and to to accelerate uh, some of that, and I would I would add to that um, also a responsibility for civil society to do even more in making sure that people um, on the move in need for solutions actually have the information uh, they need uh, to be able to make the right uh, decisions them, uh, them, themselves and. Uh, yeah, it's just uh, th there is just a lot of work for all of us uh, to do there. Um, on the EU resettlement framework, um, obviously this is a very welcome uh, development. Uh, first of all, uh, because I think it uh, it standardizes uh, uh, the approach uh, of the of the EU. It, it really establishes it firmly as a sustainable. A durable solution within uh, the, the EU as well, which is, I think, very necessary. Um, but of course, uh, the success, ultimate success of it, uh, falls with um, the true commitments that countries make to resettlement, uh, numbers that need to go up, um, and then commitments that need to go beyond numbers, but that need to go towards actual uh, uh, resettlement uh, that needs to you know, results in national budgets, making funding available for this, uh, for this type of work. So, so it's a really welcome step. Um, it will definitely result in sustainability, but there are a few more steps uh, needed that now are with national governments to, um, uh, to, to step up in that, in that front as well. And, and that's what we um, yeah, hope will, will happen next. Thank you so much. Um, now, as mentioned, the um, the question that was posed beforehand um, is, uh, as you adopt refugee labor mobility pathways as an innovative solution for protection, to what extent are the US and EU thinking about ensuring that these pathways are protection sensitive? So offering durable solutions to a path to permanent residence citizenship. And this is indeed something that we've um, been seeing discussed in, in a variety of on a variety of occasions. Um, how do we find the balance between, on the one hand, emphasizing and identifying those that are most vulnerable, but also then um, orienting ourselves towards the skills that um, people in need of international protection might have? Um, of course, there are also challenges when it comes to issuing visas that are then dependent on employment rather than protection. So, Ambassador, if you can maybe share um, and elaborate uh, a bit more on that. Um, the floor is yours. Sure. No, it's a great question. And we've had for, for many years in my country, we have had labor pathways that were related to skills that we were lacking in the United States or to, to migrants of, of exceptional of exceptional abilities. They um, had the ability to, to migrate and to get permanent residence and to become American citizens, and we are, after all, a nation of immigrants, so that has long been a tradition in our country, but uh, we are now, and our, and our refugee resettlement pathway in the United States has, um, since its inception, been protection focused. It has been directed at those people with the greatest protection needs, the greatest vulnerability identified by the High Commissioner for Refugees. And that has been the focus of our refugee resettlement um, program to date. We are now getting ready to undertake a pilot for a labor refugee um, identification and resettlement where we will look at people who have protection needs, who, who meet the criteria for resettlement as refugees, but who also may, in addition, have particular skills that employers in the United States or communities in the United States are looking for. And this is a new approach for us. And we're starting off with a, with a small pilot. I, I will um, share that we are speaking with some of our partners. The Canadians, for example, have had a program like this for, for some years and which has been very successful. So um, we are conferring with them and, and trying to get advice and, and looking at how we can have a program that has both protection um, 
aspects as well as, as these labor aspects that we're looking for. And it's a pilot and we'll see how it goes, but, but we've had sort of these two parallel processes in the United States of labor-related migration and refugee resettlement based on protection. And we'll see how we can make them combine into, into this new pilot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, very interesting to hear. And likewise, in addition to the Resettlement Diplomacy Network, um, interesting developments that um, I'm sure we'll hear more about in the coming months. Now, we're uh, close, to, uh, close to the end of the event. Um, and before handing over to the Deputy Director General, I just want to add, we received one more question for clarification um, in terms of whether there's a role for civil society organizations to become involved and contribute to the Resettlement Diplomacy Network. Um, so happy to hear from you, Deputy Director General, first, and then um, perhaps Ambassador, if you could um, uh, comment on the second question. No, I just wanted to comment quickly on the uh, labor mobility and resettlement, huh? because I think it's it's like you described, it's a toolbox. Huh? So it's one option. And we are also trying to take a bit of innovation here because we have also, uh, we are now funding a, a, a project that is called EU Pass World Project that selects on the basis of skills for admission under humanitarian corridors. And it's a, it's a small project, but it's an important one to take lessons because I think the more the better and the more flexible the better as well huh? we we have to develop there then i saw a few questions in the chat also uh, linked to you know should we talk more between the us and the eu i do think we talk quite a lot but uh, we can always do better of course huh? uh, and my migration is something to be handled internationally and there's certainly um, a, a key element that we that we also uh, learn from each other. And I think we are at the moment going slightly different ways, but we're looking at each other. How can you manage correctly, fairly, and sustainably uh, in, in, in uh, all the, the, the needs that the people in, for protection have? And on the diplomacy network, I leave this to the leader, the US. <laughs> So yeah, uh, Beata, I agree. We speak a lot. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm talking uh, with uh, with the commissioner or with the directors general uh, uh, with the European Union. I visit Brussels quite regularly, and and of course we're also in contact virtually. So, uh, but I always welcome the opportunity to speak more with my with my uh, colleagues and friends in the EU. In terms of the Resettlement Diplomacy Network, we actually have a secretariat that is made up of um, uh, civil society organizations. Um, it, it's still a new initiative. We're still, uh, we have an expression uh, that's become very fashionable in the United States that we're building the plane as we're flying it. So we are building this resettlement diplomacy network as we are launching it. And we have been having some conversations about how to bring in the perspectives and the support of civil society organizations within the initiative. I think there's, Lots of people have good ideas, as we've heard from Hans today, who's had a lot of good ideas. So we would welcome um, more perspectives, more ideas, more support from civil society for the work that the RDN is doing. Uh, we would welcome the opportunity to have the civil society organizations amplify what we're doing within the network. So um, we will continue to incorporate those views within the RDN airplane as we fly it. Thank you so much for clarifying. Um, and um, likewise, I think the more we can harness the knowledge um, and the experiences that exist out there, the better. Um, apologies if there's background noise. Um, we are now close to the, uh, to the end of the event. Um, and I can only share personally that having um, moderated and organized these sort of uh, transatlantic exchanges for several years now, it's quite impressive to see how um, in just two years, the US and the United, uh, the US and the EU have managed to really boost the kind of coordination and cooperation that's ongoing. It's not just about the the, uh, the ministerial meeting um, that happens uh, twice a year, um, but also with the recent um, exchanges, which um, in light, of course, of the um, of the crisis in Afghanistan and then also Ukraine is much needed. And I think um, is only goes to show that there is um, when there's willingness, there is also space to not only on a practical level, but really also on a strategic level to try and find solutions um, 
not just for the United States and the EU separately, um, because as the discussion has clearly shown, there's a lot of um, experiences and lessons learned that can be shared and potentially also adapted and applied in the uh, in the respective context, but really to join together um, and to try and coordinate both in times of crises, but also beyond. So with that, I would like to thank all of you. I would like to thank the ambassador for joining us, to for the uh, deputy director general for joining us on a somewhat more uh, shorter notice. And of course, to Mr. Van der Verde, um, it was a pleasure to hear from all of you. I'd also like to thank our partners once again, in particular, Brian Street from the US mission here in Brussels. And finally, I would like to thank all of you for participating and joining us today. The EPC's migration team will continue working around the topic as well as opportunities for more transatlantic cooperation. In fact, we uh, did an event on uh, climate change, migration and displacement. And I saw that the State Department just issued um, a, a new strategic outlook on working around this issue. So uh, again, a sign that there are more issues to be discussed in these kinds of contexts coming up. Um, and I would also like to encourage all of you to keep an eye out for a few further events as well as publications in the coming months. So thanks again. Thank you, Helena, and thanks to EPC for organizing this, this terrific discussion. I really enjoyed it, and I, I took some notes of things that I'm going to follow up on. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Have a good day.